Our world is a world in this galaxy where life acts. This is the only planet discovered so far where life envelops it in numerous forms. This is where plants and trees and microlife, like microbes, germs and bacteria exist. There also inhabit ferocious animals like the lion, the forest king, and enormous ones like the elephant and giraffe. Moreover, most intelligent species possessing keen brains, the human, is found on this planet Earth. There is so much beauty and variety found on Earth alone, and nowhere else. So why can life survive on Earth alone in this entire universe? If we look for a solution to this, we find that there are some reasons why our Earth is the most unique planet in the universe. For life to evolve on any planet, the planet must have its own atmosphere, with an ideal gas ratio, liquid water, and its own magnetic field. Due to the factors, Earth has been evolving life for millions of years. Our Earth is special in our solar system because it has its own atmosphere. The balance of gases in this atmosphere is maintained in a specific ratio, which allows life to flourish. The Earth's atmosphere acts as a shield of protection, much like a soldier puts on a bulletproof vest to guard against bullets. Similarly, our Earth atmosphere guards it against bullets in space known as asteroids. These asteroids are so dangerous that if directly land on the surface of Earth, life on our planet may be at risk. A fine example of how dangerous asteroids are is something that we all hear and read on a daily basis. From the traces found on Earth's surface to below, it is believed that during the Jurassic period, dinosaurs ruled the Earth. They stretched from the surface to the ocean's depths and the sky's heights. They went as far as the eye could see, but then one day a massive asteroid plummeted onto Earth. In the moment it struck, catastrophic earthquakes shook the world. The earthquakes shook dormant volcanoes into action, and volcanoes erupted everywhere. The impact was so immense that winds blew at hundreds of kilometers per hour. Due to the impact, Earth's outer crust shattered completely and scattered into the atmosphere in fragments. They landed on the ground as fireballs incinerating all animals that came in their path. So much energy was liberated in the impact that Earth's temperature rose to about 160 degrees Celsius. This heat combined with ferocious winds became even more deadly, sending millions of animals into permanent sleep. The impact created such severe tsunami waves in oceans that even ocean animals died. Dinosaurs were completely wiped out from Earth. It is said that this impact killed almost 75% of Earth's animal and plant life for good. From here, you can think about how horrific is the view when an asteroid collides with Earth's atmosphere. It is just that showering of asteroids has not stopped even today. Even today, there are hundreds of asteroids that attempt to land on Earth's surface daily. But as soon as they are in the Earth's atmosphere, the friction causes them to evaporate and turn into ashes before reaching the ground. Despite that, the threat to life from space trash is always there. So far, our atmosphere has been protecting us with all its might. We know that the sun is the primary source of energy on our planet. Ultraviolet rays are emitted from the sun, but have we ever thought about why these rays never reach us? The reason lies within our atmosphere, the top part of which is composed of ozone gas. This gas shields us from ultraviolet rays so that they cannot reach Earth's surface keeping the life on our planet running without an obstruction. No other planet in our solar system has such a shield, and that's why life is impossible elsewhere. Now we have the question of how Earth's atmosphere was formed and where its gases came from. Was Earth's atmosphere ever present in the form that we are aware of it in today? Were the ratios of gases in the atmosphere always constant? There are so many questions, and in order to find their answers, we have to go on a long trip. As usual, we're going to find answers to our questions, starting with the formation of the universe. About 14 billion years ago, when there was the Big Bang, our universe as it is today was totally filled with energy. Here, all energy particles that existed were moving away from one another at a gigantic speed. Yet, when suddenly gravity emerged, things that were moving apart began to move in towards one another at a gigantic speed. This made the force of gravity stronger still, pulling things together at an even quicker rate. Because of this, they began coming together and created the first atom of the universe, a hydrogen atom. The entire universe became filled with hydrogen atoms. Due to gravity, these hydrogen atoms started moving towards one another. The gravity at that time was so strong that hydrogen and similarly charged hydrogen atoms joined together and formed the first helium atom in the atmosphere. Due to this process, various types of atoms began to exist in the universe. 
Due to this process, various types of gas atoms were formed in space. About four billion years ago, our planet was created. After that, it was a giant molten globe orbiting around the sun. Earth did not have any kind of atmosphere. The early solar system was incredibly violent with mayhem everywhere. Big bodies were consuming smaller bodies. In the race to consume each other, our Earth was also involved. Since its formation, Earth has been one of the larger planets in the universe. Therefore, before any other planet consumed it, Earth consumed other planets. This was beneficial since most of the universe's materials began to mix with the surface of Earth. Once Earth stabilized itself and consumed all the smaller bodies around it, our solar system began stabilizing. The Earth then started revolving around the Sun, a huge fireball in the universe. The chaos, however, hadn't completely stopped. Space debris continued to pummel the surfaces of Earth and other planets. The instant Earth's upper crust began to cool down, a little bit of debris would strike it and raise the surface temperature again. But this shower was beneficial as the rubble had deposited many constituents of the world upon planet Earth. Along with them, gases like nitrogen and carbon dioxide arrived on Earth's surface. Inert gases also entered Earth's atmosphere. Due to Earth's very large gravitational force, the gases released during these impacts began accumulating in space around it. These constantly amassing gases formed the very first layer of the atmosphere. Approximately 3.8 billion years ago, as Earth's crust cooled, the majority of the carbon dioxide gas along with the bombardment dissolved in Earth's surface water. The carbon dioxide dissolved, reacting with the magnesium and calcium of Earth's crystalline rocks to form magnesium carbonate and calcium carbonate. The carbon dioxide precipitated out, forming metal carbonates, beginning to accumulate as sediment on the water. About 3.4 billion years ago, nitrogen began forming the second layer of Earth's atmosphere, which caused Earth's temperature to cool. But we should also not forget that there were traces of life on Earth about 3.5 billion years ago. That is, Earth's life began about 3.5 billion years ago, when the atmosphere contained the highest carbon dioxide, and when nitrogen had not yet started to form the atmosphere. The problem then is this. If nitrogen, the stabilizer of the atmosphere, was not yet present, how could Earth's carbon dioxide saturated atmosphere beget life? How did liquid water survive? It is estimated that at this point, the sun was 30% dimmer than at present. That has been challenging scientists for decades, but yet they have failed to come up with a clinching solution. Geological evidence of the Earth's temperature at that time suggests that it was very hot likely due to a high concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Or perhaps if carbon dioxide was not widespread, another gas that is a greenhouse gas, methane, existed in the atmosphere to compensate for the diminished luminosity of the sun by contributing the necessary heat. This methane would have come from methane-forming organisms. The early atmosphere of Earth contained nitrogen, carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, and hydrogen, but no oxygen gas at all. Such an atmosphere is called a reducing atmosphere. With the evolution of Earth's atmosphere, life continued to evolve. In the ocean depths, life began to help in the evolution of the atmosphere. Approximately 2.7 billion years ago, a bacterium called cyanobacteria existed in the ocean depths. This bacterium used sunlight to split carbon dioxide into oxygen using the process of photosynthesis increasing the concentration of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere. The rising concentration of oxygen once again disturbed the balance of the gases in the atmosphere. The Huronian Ice Age started around 2.4 billion years ago, so-called because the temperature of Earth plummeted instantly to sub-zero levels. Consequently, a vast ice cover blanketed the whole planet, and it appeared as if life had ceased to exist. The high oxygen content of the present atmosphere was generated by cyanobacteria, and proof of this can be seen in 2.7 billion-year-old stromatolite fossils. The initial instance of oxygen production by cyanobacteria is known as the Great Oxidation Event, and its traces are visible everywhere on Earth. Fossils dating back about 2.4 billion years ago, a soil fossil, contain very little iron and reflect an anoxic environment. Researchers have also found grains that can survive very low oxygen environments. Evidence of the Great Oxidation Event is red bed sandstones with hematite coating, which is due to iron oxidation to its ferric state.
which confirms that there was sufficient oxygen in the environment then. This evidence confirms that cyanobacteria were the source of oxygen levels rising. Also, the record of the great oxidation event is observed in the banded iron formations, consisting of alternating bands of hematite, iron oxide and magnetite. Such formations, present in enormous quantities all over the world, began forming around 2.5 billion years ago and continued for the last 1.85 billion years. Banded iron formations are a product of partial oxidation of ferric and ferrous oxides, that is, oxygen had accumulated enough in the atmosphere by now. Scientists also use a process known as mass-dependent fractionation to study the early atmosphere. This process analyzes the mass of isotopes of elements in the atmosphere, which is a simpler way to tell what the early atmosphere consisted of. Mass-dependent fractionation observations of sulfur isotopes around 2.4 billion years ago show that vast quantities of ultraviolet radiation were penetrating Earth's surface, making sulfur atoms very prone to breaking apart. However, sulfur isotopic records ceased after 2.3 billion years ago, indicating that the ozone layer in the upper atmosphere had developed and was protecting the surface from ultraviolet radiation. This brought variation in sulfur's mass-dependent fractionation data to an end. Apart from ultraviolet radiation, ionized harmful rays, like hydrogen ions from the sun, also easily reached the surface of Earth. These rays were crucial in the formation of water molecules on Earth. As scientists would have it, ultraviolet light and detritus pounding the Earth's surface in the first few days of a chaotic universe brought oxygen atoms, which combined with hydrogen ions from the sun to form water molecules, creating enormous oceans. Without this, scientists hypothesize, water would never be found on the Earth's surface. And without water, life or life-sustaining gases like oxygen would never have existed. The great oxidation event is supposed to have started due to cyanobacteria photosynthesis, but there was ambiguity when the traces of cyanobacteria were discovered in the Archean Eon, long before the great oxidation event. If there existed cyanobacteria in the Archean Eon, then why did the Great Oxidation event not begin then? The shapes which are supposed to be fossils of cyanobacteria are rocks dating about 3.5 billion years ago and microfossils that are supposed to be cyanobacteria cells. These fossils are present only in highly extreme environments like those of Western Australia. But some scientists believe that these supposed cyanobacterial fossils might be abiotically created during the Archean Eon, or maybe non-cyanobacterial phototrophic bacteria-like fossils, which were similar to cyanobacteria, but not actually fossils of cyanobacteria. Fossils from Western Australia's Pilbara coast, which exist in Archean Eon sedimentary rocks, contain chemical mixtures of ancient organisms. Studies on these fossils presented surprising results, like the existence of chemicals, such as 2-alpha-methylhopane, found only in cyanobacteria and steranes, found in eukaryotic life. This proves that there were cyanobacteria-like bacteria that generated oxygen through photosynthesis in the Archean Eon. The evidence from such biomarkers was not sure or reliable, and thus such a form of evidence was mostly discredited. The question remains, where did Earth's atmospheric oxygen originate? Oxygen is believed to have originated as a byproduct of the photosynthesis of cyanobacteria's ancestors, which had evolved around 2.7 billion years ago. Prior to around 2 billion years ago, atmospheric oxygen was very low and available oxygen was the cause of banded iron formation. Cyanobacteria, under favorable conditions, expanded at an astounding rate about 1.85 billion years ago. What were these favorable conditions that allowed cyanobacteria to grow en masse? One theory is that cyanobacteria were the initial organisms to produce oxygen through photosynthesis in sunlight. Living in an oxygen atmosphere, however, required the enzyme superoxide dismutase, which had yet to evolve. Without this enzyme, cyanobacteria could not survive. Photosynthetic oxygen most likely converted ferrous iron in the oceans to ferric iron forming banded iron and detoxifying oxygen toxicity. This allowed cyanobacteria to survive without the enzyme and to reproduce rapidly. Records in the atmosphere, however, show 400 million years of absence between the presence of oxygen 
and photosynthetic oxygen production. Scientists believe that oxygen produced by photosynthesis creates carbonic carbon, which acts on mineral ores to form oxides, preventing free oxygen from accumulating in the atmosphere. Mineral ores must be buried deep within Earth before they can interact with oxygen for oxygen to accumulate freely. Carbonic carbon, sulfides, and iron ores deep within Earth show that their formation was as a result of interaction with atmospheric oxygen. Hence, the 400 million year gap likely occurred due to the fact that oxygen reacted with mineral ores for such a long duration. When these minerals got buried, oxygen began accumulating freely in the atmosphere. Available information shows that through carbonic carbon and pyrite buried beneath the surface of Earth, about 15.8 plus 3.3 teramoles of oxygen get created each year in the atmosphere. As oxygen levels increased, the number of plants on Earth also increased. These plants played a role in covering up carbon beneath the surface. With cyanobacteria and green plants, two sources were now available to increase atmospheric oxygen. Over time, the atmosphere of Earth became what it is today. As a solution to the 400 million year gap, it has been suggested by some scientists that ancient chemosynthetic life would have produced methane and possibly have outcompeted oxygen producing life, so oxygen accumulated over time. Chemosynthetic life requires nickel to produce methane, and during Earth's early hot world, nickel was abundant, with erupting volcanoes being one large source. In these circumstances, oxygen-producing life was unable to compete with chemosynthetic life. As Earth's surface cooled and volcanic activity slowed, nickel production decreased, reducing methane production by chemosynthetic organisms. This allowed oxygen-producing organisms to thrive, possibly explaining the 400 million year gap. Despite various explanations, the exact source of atmospheric oxygen remains unknown, with no universally accepted explanation. Scientists have divided the protective atmosphere on Earth into five layers. The largest among these, taking about 80% of the atmosphere, is the troposphere that extends up to 12 kilometers above the ground. It can vary in thickness, with about 9 and 17 kilometers at the polar regions. All the water vapor occurs here and governs weather on Earth. The bottom segment of the troposphere is hot, capturing warmth waves from the ground, while the top portion is cold as heat waves would not flow quickly there. Above the troposphere comes the stratosphere, going as high as 55 kilometers. Here, temperature with increasing altitude is enhanced by the existence of the ozone layer that holds ultraviolet rays, which warm the Earth from 60 degrees Cs at the base to degrees Cs at the surface. The mesosphere, going up to 85 kilometers high, has temperatures dropped to Piton 85 degrees Cs, freezing water vapor into ice droplets. This level burns most meteors, protecting the Earth from cosmic aggressions. The thermosphere, extending up to 1,000 kilometers, contains temperatures of 1,500 degrees Cs. Its lower region, the ionosphere, is water vapor free and is used for the deployment of satellites. The exosphere, extending up to 10,000 kilometers, consists of low-density gases like hydrogen, helium, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and oxygen. Hence, Earth's defense atmosphere is a marvelous display of nature's masterpiece, allowing life to grow freely. It shields us from hazards from space and harmful ultraviolet rays, doing the most important task in preserving life for millions of years. Without it, Earth would be similar to other inhospitable planets in our solar system without nature's marvel. It is our responsibility to save this shield with continuous efforts.